Are you all muted? Are you all muted? I can't hear you guys. Why? Okay. You ready to go? Okay, good morning everyone. Um, Tuesday is a special day. We know that Hashem created the world. He said Kitov twice on the Tuesday. So let's hope it's a day with double good. So normally this is a Pasha Shir, which we are going to connect um, the Shir with Pasha as well. But I'm going to keep the focus on Pesach and share with you some insights. And also hopefully bring it into the current situation as well. So, what I'm going to really do is share with you two insights to do with the time that we're in, this week that we're in, this Parsha, connect them to each other and with the situation. So, Parsha's Vayikra, the, this week's Parsha, is a, starts a very, very complex process of the Torah explaining the concept of Korbanus, of sacrifices, um, which is a, a very big topic on its own, a very big discussion on its own. But... Interestingly, very much connected with Pesach, because we know that on Pesach, we say that the Seder, we say that um, Rabbi Gamliel said that there's three things you must focus on during the Seder, Pesach, Matzah, and Moror, the, the, sac the sacrificial lamb, the Paschal offering, the eating of Matzah, and the eating of Maror. Now, today we eat Matzah, we eat Maror, but we don't have a temple, so we don't eat the Korban Pesach, but we talk about it. And, in fact, during the Seder, we pray to God, to bring back the temple, to bring back the Beis Amikdash, so that we can once again um, eat from the Korban Pesach, offer the Paschal Lamb in the Beis Amikdash, and eat from its meat at the Seder. Okay, so we're going to bear this in mind, bear this thought, because we're going to come back and talk about the Korban Pesach in just a moment. But first, this past Shabbos, I was going to say this past Shabbos we read in Shul. Uh, we didn't read it in Shul, actually because uh, we weren't in Shul. But it was, the Torah reading included the fourth one of the four parashiyas, of the four um, special portions that we read around this time of the year. And we read what's called Parshas HaChodesh. Or we should have read Parshas HaChodesh. Parshas HaChodesh is the special reading that we read around this time of the year, talking about the first mitzvah the Jews were given as a nation, which is the uh, mitzvah of the calendar. And... Also, the mitzvah of the Korban Pesach. Now, in the midst of the calendar, it says, HaChodesh Chazer Lachem Rosh Chadashim. This month, God tells us that this month of Nisan, which is, by the way, beginning tomorrow night on, on Rosh Chodesh, tomorrow night and Thursday. So Thursday is the first of Nisan. Nisan is the month of redemption. God says, HaChodesh Chazer Lachem, this month will be to you Rosh Chodashim, the beginning of all months. Now the Medrash and Chazal tell us that before the exodus from Egypt, Tishrei, the month where we celebrate Rosh Hashanah, was considered the month ahead of the first month of the year. But for the Jewish nation, after the exodus from Egypt, Chodesh Nisan, the month of Nisan, becomes the first month of the year, of the year, the first month of all the months of the year. Obviously, we still celebrate Rosh Hashanah. But in terms of the cycle of months, it's, Nisan is the first, month, uh, the first month of that cycle. So let's just for a moment, um, let's explore the sim symbolism of these two months. The month of Nisan, which has Pesach, the month of Tishrei, which has Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So the month of Tishrei, the month of Tishrei is what we call the month of creation. It's when God created the world, and we'll explore that a bit more in a moment. Um, meaning that what that month represents really is the world. And with the world comes the finiteness of the world, the limitation of the world, the finite creation, the routine that we call Teva, the routine that we call nature. In other words, the fact that God created a system where things happen according to a specific routine, a specific system, called the system of Teva. And kind of the world, other than certain times, is almost locked in 
by divine ordination, by divine creation, controlled by God, of course, because he's the ultimate control of everything. But the world is kind of locked into the world of Teva, the world of nature, the finiteness of nature. Nisan, on the other hand, the month of Nisan, is known as the month of miracles. The Talmud in Brachot, the Gemara Brachas, tells us that when Nun, the letter Nun, um, in fact, it's a Gemara which deals with dreams, a whole very interesting, fascinating Gemara about things that people see in dreams or what it means. And the Gemara says that if you see a Nun, the letter Nun in your dream, it's a symbolism of Nisim, of miracles. If you see double Nun, two Nuns, it's Nisse Nisim, double miracles. Miracles are miracles. Well, the, Nis, the month of Nisan, the word Nes actually means a miracle. The word Nisan actually has two Nuns. So it's a month of extraordinary concept of miracles. In other words, what does Nisan represent? Infin infinity, God's power of infinity. The ability that he has to transcend nature. That he's not locked into nature at all, that he can do whatever he wants. He can split a red sea, he can blink plague, plagues. It's the Koach HaNes. It's the power of miracles, the power of infinity. In other words, what these two months represent, the month of Tishrei and the month of Nisan, is what we call in Kabbalistic terminology the Koach HaGvul and the Koach HaBligvul. The power that God has to manifest himself in a limited way, the power that God has to manifest himself in an infinite way, in an unlimited way. So Tishrei is the power of Gvul. It's more about how the world exists in its limited way. Nisan is the month of miracles, the month where God displays his ability to transcend the limitation of the world, the finiteness of the world, and to be completely infinite, manifested often in the concept of miracles. Now, what I want to do is just see how this is expressed in many, many, many different ways. So some of you might be aware that um, on Pesach, we pray for dew, for tal. On the first day of Pesach, we have the tefillat tal. The, the prayer for, for dew. Tishrei, in the month of Tishrei, towards the end of Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret, we pray for Geshem, we pray for rain. What is the difference between Geshem and Tal? The symbolisms the commentators explain between rain and dew is this. Rain is something that happens as a result. It comes, it rains down from the heavens, so to speak, but as a result of what takes place here. As the Pasuk tells us in the very beginning of Breshis, the Eid Ya'le Min Ha'aretz, a cloud, a mist, evaporates and comes up from the, from, the, from the ground, forms the clouds and the cloud sends rain. In other words, Tishrei, when we play for rain, rain represents what the limited world can offer, can contribute. Tal, dew, on the other hand, actually represents God's gifts, where he's not dependent on what happens in this world. As the Gemara tells us, Tal loy me'etzai. Dew never stops. Dew falls every day. Every single day, night, whatever the case is, dew always is a constant. It has nothing to do with what we are going through. It has nothing to do with the way the world is working. It is part of the system. It just comes every day. God sends it every day. In other words, what Tal, dew, which we pray for on Pesach, represents is the concept of God's gift to us, God manifestation to us, where he's totally not connected to what happens in this finite world. It's not connected to the power of Gvul, the power of being finite, but rather it's infinite, it's transcendent, it's got nothing to do with this world, it comes straight, Mishamayim, it comes from heaven, meaning it's a, God, it's a godly manifestation of the infinite. Which is also connected to another difference between the month of Nisan and the month of Tishrei. In a few minutes, hopefully, you're going to see where I'm going with all this. But another difference, we know that Tishrei, the month of Tishrei, very much connected with what we call the Avodat Adam, the, the service that we can do. What is Tishrei all about? Shuvah. It's about repentance. It's about feeling that we're distant and far, and it's about us making a move, us trying. We need to reconnect. We need to return to God. We need to make amends. We need to work through our struggles and our weaknesses and our transgressions and our, and our shortcomings and ask for forgiveness. It's what we need to do. It emphasizes the person, the physical human being that exists within the physical world. Nisan is very different. 
What do we say at the Seder in, in the Haggadah? In the Seder we say, Va'at oreim ve'eria, that God says to us that when, when we went out of Egypt, we were completely naked, symbolically, of any good things. We were naked of mitzvot, and we didn't have to do anything. God totally did the whole job. Nigla alehem melech malchem lochem akadosh baruchu ugi alam. God revealed Himself, schlepped us out of Mitzrayim. We were totally passive at that point, and God just did it for us. We emerged from Mitzrayim like a completely new being. Past was irrelevant. We were completely metamorphosized. We were completely transformed into something completely new, like a baby that was born. The metaphor is often given like a like a gershonit gayer, like a convert who completely has no connection to the past. It's a new being. It's a new creation. God just gave it to us. We didn't have to do anything for it. Same idea. Nisan is the power of infinity. It's God's month. What He does for us. Tishrei, we need to do the work. We need to work through the struggles. We need to go through the process. Now, I'm going to share with you, you see what all this is going to come, come together in a moment, and then we're going to go through a whole process about the Korban Pesach and how it relates to our Pasha. But there's a fascinating Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, in the Tractate Rosh Hashanah. A dispute about when the world was actually created which kind of on the surface undoes what we've just been discussing, but hold it there. Rabbi Yehoshua is of the opinion that the world was actually created in Nisan, not Tishrei, as we always say. Rabbi Eliezer is of the view that the world was created in Tishrei. Now, we have a principle in disputes in the Talmud that Eilu v'Eilu divrei elokim chayim, that when there's a dispute, both opinions are legitimate. Both opinions are part of Torah. Both opinions are the Word of God. Now, that's very nice when you have a dispute that's halachic. So, for example, uh, Bet Shammai says we should light Hanukkah candles in one way, eight candles on the first night. Bet Hillel says we should do one candle. So they're both right, meaning they're both a legitimate halachic Torah perspective. We then have a system of how we decide what actually to do in practice. So we light one candle, we follow the view of Bet Hillel, but Bet Shammai's view is still Torah. It's still legitimate. But when you have a dispute, the mitziyut, in other words, you have a, a dispute, in fact, what happened? So how can they both be right? Can't both be right. The world was only created, the world was created either in Nisan or in Tishrei. So how can you have a dispute and say they're both right? So the uh, Kabbalists explain, and... This is actually reflected in one version of Tosfos, which is a famous comment, commentary on the, on the Gemara. I say one version because there are various versions of the same passage, and the way it's printed in our Talmud actually says something different, but, but one version of Tosfos reflects this idea as well. That actually, when we have a machloket, when we have a dispute, a factual dispute, they're also both right, just it happens on different levels. So obviously, in actual fact, it only happened one way, but they're both right. Let me explain. So the, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Arizal, I think it is, explains the following. Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Lezer are both right. However, the world was created on two levels. Dibur and Machshava, in speech and in thought. Now we know if you look at Bereshit, if you look at the Genesis, if you look at how the, how the world was created, so we know that the world was created through speech, as Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, tells us. Basarama marot nivra olam. The world was created with ten utterances. Now, whatever that means in terms of God's speech, a whole other discussion is for a different shir, it's not for now. But we, the concept of speech is how the world was created, the level of speech. However, says the result, that happened according to Rabbi Lezer, and that's what actually happened. It happened in Tishrei. However, in Nisan, the world was created, the machshava, the thought process, again, whatever that means, in God's context. The thought of the, the machshava, the thought to create a world, so to speak, happened in Nisan. So God created the world in his thought, whatever that means, in Nisan. And in Dibur, through actual speech, which was how the world was actually created in the month of Tishrei. Which then creates a big problem in the context of what we said before. That means that Nisan is not just a month of miracles. It's not just a month of infinity. It's not just a month of infinite godly revelation. It means the month of Nisan is also connected with the creation of the finite world. So what does that mean? We just finished saying 
We just explored the distinction between the month of Nisan and Tishrei. We said Tishrei is the month of the world. Nisan is the, which is finite. Struggles. The, the, all the limitations of the world. Nisan is the month of infinity. Nisan is the month of infinite miracles. Godly, inf infinite revelation. But nothing to do with the world. And the limitations of the world. Now we're saying no. Nisan is the month that God created the world. But Shabbat created the world with thought. So it means Nisan is connected on some level with the world. So the explanation is as follows. That when, what does it mean to create something by So it works like this. So this is the punchline, and this is really important. If I build a house, I think about the house first. Then I go and build it. The actual building of the house takes place when I build it. However, the goal of the house takes place when I think about it. In other words, when I think about, you know, I need to build a house. At that point, why, why do I think I need to build a house? Because I've got a goal, what I want to use the house for. I've got a goal how to use the house, what the, what the purpose the house is going to serve. My intention, the kavana, that lives in my thought. Then I say, okay, so then the conclusion is I need to build a house. When I go build a house, the actual building of the house, when I'm building the house, or the builders are building the house, I'm much more involved in actual construction I'm not so involved in the, in the intention or the mission or the goal. After it's finished, I'll go back to my goal. But while I'm building it, the construction is what's really occupying my mind, so to speak. So when I think about the house, the emphasis is on the goal. And I build the house, the emphasis is on the building. When God wanted to create the world, what's the intention of the world? Is the intention of the creation of the world and the mission that we, particularly as Jews, have is the intention for it to remain a finite place, to remain a place of darkness, to remain a, a place of struggle, with all of the challenges that come with a finite creation? No. That's not the, cre that's not the intention. God created a finite world. God created a limited world. God created a world where His infinity is not revealed and manifested, but it has a goal. The goal is to reveal infinity. The goal is to bring the infinite God into the world through mitzvot, through Torah, through doing what we need to do, to, through, through rising above our own finiteness, by rising above being finite, by going beyond ourselves, by growing as people, by, by displaying that in the world of the finite we can become infinite. In the world of the finite, we can grow, we can go beyond our comfort zone, we can do Torah, we can learn God's Torah, which is one with Him. We can do His mitzvot, which connect to Him. And we can bring the infinite God into the finite creation. That's the goal of creation. Ah, now it all comes together. The world was created, the machshava, in thought, in the month of Nisan. Nisan is the month of infinity. Nisan is the month of miracles. Nisan is the month of God's infinite revelation. That is when he thought about the world in his thought. He said, you know, I want to, I want to create a world. But the goal, remember, in thought is where the goal lives. What is the goal of this world? Not the finiteness of the world. The girl, world is finite. It is a dark place. It is a challenging place. But the goal of the world is Nissan. The goal of the world is bringing the Nissan energy the miraculous energy, the manifestation of infinity, godliness, into the finite world. That's why the world is created in thought in Nisan, because Nisan is the goal of the world. In actual fact, it's built in Tishrei, because that's when the construction takes place. That's when Tishrei has to take place. That's when the world has to take place. God creates this finite world, and then he says, now... Go ahead and bring the infinity into the world. You do Torah, you learn, you do, learn Torah, you do mitzvot, you grow as a person and bring, change the world, bring light into the darkness, bring infinity into the finiteness, bring Nisan into Tishrei. You know, this connects to the very first Rashi in the Chumash. Very fascinating Rashi. Famous Rashi, fascinating Rashi which is also connected to the parasha, which we should have read this past Shabbos, Parashat HaChodesh. 
where the first mitzvah was given to the Jewish people as a nation to make the calendar. So on the very first pasuk of the Torah, Bereshit, famous Rashi, where he starts with Amor Rabbi Yitzchak. The pasuk says in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Rashi says, Rabbi Yitzchak asked the question, shouldn't the Torah have begun with HaChodesh Hazel Lachem? It should have begun with the portion of when Hashem gives the Jewish people the first mitzvah. The depth of that question, by the way, is because the, the Torah is not a history book. The Torah is a, a book of mitzvot. It's a book of how to live our lives. So on a simple level, that's what Rashi is asking. It should have started with the first mitzvah given to us as a nation. Okay. It says Rashi, Ma tam patach bibereshit. So why does it start with Genesis? Why does it start with the story of creation? Says Rashi, the famous thing, Koach amo, because he was telling us he started with a big bang to tell us the power of his actions. And it's all got to do with Israel. That we are going to live in Israel, the Jewish people, and there's going to be a situation where people, the nations of the world, are going to come and say to us, Listim Atem, you're a people of thieves. you robbers. You've taken our land. So we're going to answer them. Bereshit okay. God created the world. He controls the world. He gives the lands to whom he wishes to. He gave us Israel. And it's our land. That's the simple reading of the Rashi, which is why for emphasis the Torah begins with Bereshit. But in the context of the discussion we just had, let's take it a very a much deeper level. Rashi is asking like this. The Torah, in theory, should have started with mitzvahs. Why? HaChodesh This month will be to you the first of the month, Nisan. The Torah should have started with Nisan because Nisan is the goal of the world. Nisan is, the, Nisan is the concept of infinity and the goal of the finite world is to bring infinity into the finite. However, the Torah doesn't start with that. The Torah starts with Bereshit. Why? Because the Torah needs to create a world first. You need to build the world and then bring Nisan into Tishrei. Then bring infinity into the finite, light into darkness. So therefore, what does the Torah start with? Bereshit Baralakim. The world. What kind of world is it? It's a world of darkness. It's a world where you're going to have people challenging the Jewish people and saying that you're a robber. A, Jew, a world where values are all distorted. A, a world where things can go wrong. Things can be challenged. Uh, people can say that Israel doesn't belong to us. All of these things, that's all part of the finiteness, the limitation of the creation of this world. That's the world. And that's how we, uh, then we can come with the power of the Torah, with the power of Nisan and refute that. But first you have to have the world. So therefore, Nisan is a month of miracles. It's a month of light. But it's a month which also highlights the intention of Tishrei. So it's a month, Nisan is Nisan, but it's also connected with Tishrei. Because Nisan is the month where the energy of transcendence is, is powerful. Nisan is a month where the concept of God being above creation is evident. But it's also connected to Tishrei because the Nisan is the intention of Tishrei. Nisan is the goal of Tishrei. In other words, Nisan is the message to us that we don't live in a transcendent world. We live in this world. We live in the Tishrei world. But we live in a Tishrei world in order to bring Nisan into that Tishrei world. To reveal light in darkness. To reveal miracles in nature. To reveal, to, to reveal infinity in the finite. Before we continue... I heard part of this thought yesterday in a video from, in Yiddish from a very, very great, um, I call him mentor and teacher of mine, although I've never actually, I've, I've heard Shirim before and as, when I was a student in Yeshiva, I attended some of his Shirim, but mo mainly I've learned from him online and, and recording and he, and he spoke about the current situation and he shared this idea and he said, it's exactly what's happening now. It's exactly the perspective we have, we have, to, have, we have to have now. Right now we're at a time of darkness. It's a time of challenge. And by the way, that challenge is real. It's real. We, and we have to be sensitive to that. Number one, we have to be careful. We do all the measures within nature to protect ourselves. Number two, it's painful. Just yesterday, I don't know how many people, thousands of people lost their jobs here in Australia, around the world, the economy is crumbling, and so on and so forth. People are critically ill. It's, and people have unfortunately died. It is a painful experience. That painful experience is part of the month of, month of Tishrei idea. In other words, part of the world. But one thing we sh cannot and shouldn't and sh will never do is despair. 
and ask questions like, what's going to be? Because nothing happens without a divine hand. Everything that happens is part of God's plan, part of, God, part of God's intention. And if we want to ask ourselves what's going to be, the answer is very simple. What is happening now is the superficiality of the world. The superficiality of the world is the limitation, the finiteness, the darkness, the struggle, which is all evident in the creation that took place in the month of Tishrei. But right now we're going into the month of Nisan. What's going to be is, we don't know what the purpose of all this is. We don't know exactly what God's plan is, but we do know out of this darkness is going to come light. We do know that the Nisan is going to be in the Tishrei. We do know that something very big, something very great is going to come out of this. Because as we know, the principle is that Yerida Tzore Chalia, every struggle, every descent is for the purpose of even a greater elevation, a greater ascent, a greater power. So we need to be careful and we need to be sensitive to the challenge and the pain, especially of others. But we also cannot despair. We have to have bitachon, we have to have emunah, because we have to know that out of this is going to come something unbelievable. The Nisan will, is, will illuminate the, the Tishrei. They're not two separate things. It's all God. It's all God's intention. It's all His process. The Nisan is the intention, the kavanah, the goal of Tishrei. And therefore, out of this darkness will come tremendous light. We will illuminate. We will see the light that's embedded, coded somewhere in this Tremendous, tremendous darkness. Okay, which is somewhat connected to a whole other concept. And that goes into the second part of that parsha which we read yesterday, which we, which we were supposed to read on Shabbat. It goes into the second part, into the, into the part of the Seder, where we, we haven't had a Korban Pesach because we don't have a temple, but we have the Zerah, the shank bone, to commemorate the Paschal offering. We eat the Afikoman at the Seder to remember the eating of the Paschal lamb with the Matzah. We talk about it. Rabban Gamliel, as I said before, says we have to explain it. So Korban Pesach is a very big feature in the Seder, in the Seder experience. So I want to share with you an aspect of Korban Pesach, and perhaps at the end connected to what we just explained. The Parsha tells us that we should bring Korban Pesach, the Erev Pesach. We need to bring a Paschal lamb. And the Parsha says, Mina ksavim u mina izim You can bring a Korban Pesach from sheep, lambs in other words, or goats. Either one is good. Either one is good. In Mitzrayim, in Egypt, it appears that they brought lambs. That's because that was part of the whole process. It was the Avadazara, it was the deity of Egypt. And it looks like they used lambs, sheep, lambs for the Korban Pesach. But subsequent generations, it is perfectly legitimate, either a sheep or a goat. Apparently, this is the only sacrifice where there's no preference. Goats and, 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 and uh, sheep and goats are equally legitimate, equally acceptable. Now that just seems like a small little detail, but what is the symbolism behind that? And that's what I want to explore. So in order to do that, let's have a look at our Pasha, the Pasha this week's Pasha, which is Vayikra. The Pasha Vayikra details all the laws of sacrifices. Now I need to tell you the laws of sacrifices are not easy, very, very complex part of Talmudic law. Quite complicated, kotshim. But some of the stuff is very uh, easy to understand and accessible. So we know that there are different types of sacrifices. For example, there are different, there's what we call a korban chatat. So some of these sacrifices are what we call a sin offering. In other words, some sacrifices were brought with a specific intention to atone for the person bringing the sacrifice for a specific transgression that he or sometimes a group of people, they did. Then there's other sacrifices which are not, which are not um, meant for an atonement. One of them is what we call a korban olah. A korban olah is a burnt offering. It's brought, as the Talmud tells us, as a doron, like a present to Hashem. It has a little bit of an aspect to atonement to it in certain circumstances, but 
It really is there to just come closer to Hashem. So a person wants to bring a carbon, he feels like he needs to go through the experience of bringing a carbon again, which is a separate discussion of what the experience is, but, but he wants to connect to God in a, in, a, in a bigger way. The word carbon, by the way, is not translated only as sacrifice. The word carbon actually means kiruv, to come closer to God. When a person brought a carbon, if he brought it with the right intention, he brought it properly, it brought the person and the world closer to Hashem. So therefore, a person wants just to progress, he wants to excel, he wants to do something extra for his service to Hashem. So he brings an animal as a carbon, Allah as a burnt offering, and it's a purely pres- a present to Hashem. Now, putting aside some of the carbonists that were brought from cattle, like cows and bulls and things like that, let's just talk about sheep and lambs, Kvasim and Izim. So we know that most sin offerings, right, sin offerings, most of the, were brought, were, you had, you, were, if they were brought from, from, from sheep or goats, they needed to be a goat, specifically a goat. Burnt offerings, which were brought just as a present to Hashem to progress in our own Avadat Hashem, was lambs or sheep. Kvasim, not izim. Izim is goats, kvasim is lamb, sheep, depending on how old it is. So here's an interesting thing. For some reason, sin offerings, there was an emphasis on goats. Present offerings, doron, ola, there was an emphasis on sheep. Korban Pesach was either. What's the depth behind this? Every detail in Torah, every halakha, every part of Jewish law, is really deep, has operates on many layers, there's depth behind it, there's explanations behind it. So I'm going to I'm going to um, share with you an idea that goes like this. When a person brings a carbon, we need to understand a general principle, a general problem. How does it actually work? What is the what is the power of a sacrifice? Again, this is a very complex and long discussion, but let's just take one aspect. In other words, is it that simple? If I do a transgression, I'm going to bring an animal? And, you know, now it's true, the Ramban says that, of course, the atonement didn't come just from the animal. The atonement came from the person who's bringing the animal, standing next to the korban, reflecting on tshuva, and, 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 and you know, all, that, all that whole process. And it's not just about bringing the animal. But part of it is bringing the animal. And why the, why the animal? What's the symbolism of the animal? So I'm going to show you briefly a Kabbalistic idea, but just very sort of, just take the gist of it. And the gist of it is as follows. The purpose of the animals down here are not just the animal, the physical animal. In Kabbalah we have a concept called Seder Hishtal Shalot, the evolution of spiritual worlds. And just like in this world we have animals, in the supernal world, in the godly world, in the higher world, we also have animals. In fact, you would be familiar because every single day in davening, we talk about holy animals. Chayot HaKodesh. We say, The holy animals. Who's the holy animals? The holy animals are the angels. Now, why are they? They're just holy animals. We have Yeshayahu um, and, and Yecheskel in Tanakh who prophesied and they shared with us very complex and cryptic prophecies of the celestial beings and God's chariot and so on called My Summer Cover. Yechezkel talks about four animals. He talks about the eagle. He talks about the ox. Right? These are not physical oxen and eagles. These are supernal angels, supernal divine beings. Why are they called animals? What's the energy of an animal? The person, the difference between an animal and a person is that a person primarily is driven by intellect. Hopefully, most of the time. Rationality. But the animal part of who we are, or animals, by definition, are emotional beings. They're driven by instinct, they're driven by passion, strength. The supernal beings, the angels, are also emotional beings, we are taught. There's the camp of angels led by Michael, which are the angels of chesed, the angels of love. There's the angels of, of Yira, the angels of fear, Gabriel, and so on and so forth. But they are fiery, they are passionate, they have a certain energy which is incredibly strong. 
We too, by the way, we are rational human beings, but we have within us an animalistic part, which if channeled correctly can be very strong. In fact, just to, just to explain this a bit, we have, as part of our makeup, we have two souls that we've talked about many times. We have the nefesh elokit, the godly soul, and nefesh ambamit, the animal soul. We have the godly part of who we are, and we have the animal part of who we are. The Yetzir Tov, the good inclination, comes from the godly soul, the Yetzir Hara, the, the evil inclination comes from the animal soul. But there's an interesting pasuk, two psukim, one says, that there's tremendous power in an ox. What does that mean? So we can understand this if you look at Shema, right? Shema, we say, We should love Hashem our God, with all your heart. Love Hashem your God with all your heart. Now we know in Hebrew the way to say your heart is libcha, with one time letter bet. But in the Torah it's not written like that. It's written levavcha, two bets. Levavcha. And of course, our rabbis tell us the reason is because you need to love God with both parts of who you are. The Yetzer Tov and the Yetzer Hara. Your godly soul and your animal soul. Why is that so important? Why can't you just eliminate the Yetzer Hara? Why can't we just reject the, the animal soul? The answer is because the animal soul at its core is a good thing. In fact, the animal soul is an animal. An animal has passion, has power, has energy, which is so strong, much stronger than the human being. And therefore, if we can channel the Yetzirah, if we can channel the animal soul to love God as well, we'll love God better and stronger than just loving Him from the godly soul, which is driven by insight, godly insights. So the animal energy is really strong. The animals that live in this world are rooted, they, they originate. They might be aggressive here, they might be indulgent here, whatever the case is. They might not be very holy down here. But they originate in a very, very strong and lofty, godly, godly energy. The supernal beings, the, the, great, the great angels who are the holy animals. So when we bring a carbon, we are taught, when we bring a carbon, and we achieve something spiritual through that carbon, whether it's achieving atonement or achieving just a deeper connection with God, we do it through the animal. Because when we bring the animal, the animal is elevated to its source, Kabbalah tells us. When the animal goes on the altar, it connects, it invokes, it ignites, it, it reveals its spiritual origin and the power and the passionate energy of that spiritual origin the holy animals is so strong and it reveals itself down here and it connects to the person and that is what brings about that accomplishment the achievement of the carbon whether it's the atonement or the deeper connection with god so that's essentially how the carbon works through bringing the physical animal it roots back and connects to its its spiritual origin and it's a spiritual origin which is the spiritual, passionate, animalistic power, good animalistic power, which is able to achieve all of that. Today we don't have Korbanot, but we know that davening and learning about the Korbanot, we achieve a similar concept. That's for a different discussion. Now, there are two types of different energies that we need. One is the sheep energy, one is the goat energy. Oh, what does that mean? So we have a fascinating Gemara. And I'm going to read it to you because it's very, very interesting, the, the context of this Gemara. The Gemara says like this, Rab Zeira Ashkach le Rav Yehuda. Rab Zeira once found Rav Yehuda. He was standing at the door of his father-in-law's house. And he saw that Rav Yehuda was in a, an uplifted mood, a light-hearted mood, a happy mood. The boy Minei Kol Chalale Alman, if you were to ask him anything in the world, he would have Amalei would tell him. In other words, he didn't have to ask him necessarily hardcore, complex Talmudic questions. He could ask him broader, worldly things, obviously in a context of, of, of Torah teachings, because they wouldn't have wasted their time with idle chatter. But he could ask him anything broad. So he said to him, he asked him the following question. He said to him, Amalei, Rabbi Zeru said, Rabbi Yudah, can I ask you a question? My time is Mazgan Beresha Vahadar Imri. Why is it that goats walk in front of the, the flock, in front of sheep? In other words, when there's a goat walking next to sheep, the goat will walk in front and lead the flock, and the flock will, will follow as sheep do. 
So why first goats and then sheep? Okay, that was a pretty seemingly random question. Amar lay, so he told him, and as Rashi explains, goats are generally darker, apparently, than sheep. Some of them are dark goats, they're black, or whatever the case is, but the goats are a symbolism of something which is darker than sheep, which are purely white and very, very represent light. So he said, the reason is, it's like the creation of the world. At first there was dark, and then there was light. So first, as we know, there was night, and then there was day. So first comes dark, then comes night, and then comes day. What does this tell us? This Gemara means many things, but for the context of our discussion, what does this mean? That means do- easy goats is a symbolism of darkness, of struggle. Sheep is a symbolism of light, illumination. Now, we are taught that in serving Hashem, there are two pathways, so to speak, of, of serving Hashem. There's what we call the Avada of the Baal Tshuva and the Avada of the Tzaddik. What does that mean? And they both represent a concept which could both be in one person, but they represent two different things. What's a tzaddik? A tzaddik is someone that does good. Right? A real tzaddik is someone that always serves Hashem, is on the right path, always, always doing the right thing. So what's his service to, to God? His service is just to connect deeper and deeper all the time. Try harder and do deeper. Not to fix a problem, not to transform a negative into a positive, just to deepen the positive all the time. Like an example given in the, in the Talmud of such a person was Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbeinu HaKadosh. He says he was born, he was holy, his whole life he spent in holiness. His concept was just to serve Hashem by constantly being deeper and deeper and deeper. Then there's what we call the Avadata Baal the, the, the Baal Shubha is someone who became distant from God. He encountered a challenge, got complicated in darkness, and needs to work through, it's the concept of tshuva, needs to work through the darkness in order to transform it to something more positive. Beg forgiveness, become a stronger person. Now it is true that the uh, Gemara says that Baal Shubha can be higher than a tzaddik, because the Baal Shubha was distant, and therefore when he comes back to him with more yearning, more, more, more passion, but be it as it may, it's two different ways of serving God. Therefore, goats, which are darker, the karbanot, the sacrifices of the goats, represent the avodah, the service of the tshuva process. Fixing a problem, working through the struggle, transformation, getting forgiveness and atonement. That's why when it comes to sin offerings, karban chatat, sin offerings, the emphasis is always the goat. They're mainly goats. Why? Because that's what a sin offering is. It's tshuva. Transgression, distance from Hashem, and then fixing the distance. However, the other type of korban, as I mentioned before, korban Allah, the present korban, someone who didn't commit a sin, but just wants to deepen his relationship with God, that's the, that's the avodah of the tzaddik. That's the mission of the tzaddik, just deepening the relationship all the time. Doing more good than before, not necessarily fixing a problem. That's, those karbanot are mainly sheep, because they're light. They're like the, not transforming darkness, but working within the light itself. When it comes to Pesach, so we find, both in the laws of Korban Pesach, and in the whole process of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, we find both. We mentioned before, that last Shabbos would have been the fourth of the special portions that we read on, on, on this time of the year, which is Parshat HaChodesh, Korban Pesach. But right before that, the Shabbos before that, which we did get to read, is Parshat Parat, the laws of the red heifer, which was used to purify those that come in, came into contact with a dead body. And the reason that we always read them a week apart, in other words, one week after another, is because at this time of the year, Chazal tell us, those who were impure needed the para aduma, they needed the red heifer, in order to be able to bring the carbon Pesach. 
That's a big emphasis with the Korban Pesach. We look for the people who are impure. We talk about the Paraduma, the red heifer. We make sure there's a red heifer available for those that are impure. And then they are able to become pure and to bring the Korban Pesach. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like the concept of tshuva. The idea of tshuva. The idea of being impure and then purifying itself. Para aduma and then Korban Pesach. Being impure and then bringing the Korban in order to connect to God. But now we've purified ourselves from the impurity. That's the concept of tshuva. The concept of transforming the negative into a positive. But we also know that not only people who were impure brought a Korban Pesach. If someone wasn't impure, and what that symbolically means, someone who hasn't had a problem, someone who wasn't challenged, someone who hasn't gone through a negative experience, also has to bring a Korban Pesach. That's the Tzaddik. The Tzaddik also has to bring a Korban Pesach to deepen the relationship with Hashem. So we see the Korban Pesach actually contains both aspects. The aspect of Tshuva and the aspect also of... of of the, the aspect of tshuva and also the aspect of the of, of the avodah of the tzaddik. Furthermore, if you look at the actual korban pesach itself, we see both aspects. We know that it's written in Kabbalah and Kabbalistic works that says that the people who were in Galut Mitzrayim, the Jews who were in the exile of Egypt, were a reincarnation. They were a Gilgal of those people that lived in the Dora Flaga, the generation that built the Tower of Babel, to rebel against God. And that rebellion in the Dora Flaga took place, was originated, became possible because of the original sin of Adam and Eve. Fascinating idea. And therefore, what, what does that mean? And therefore, the whole Galut, the whole exile of Egypt, and the subsequent redemption from Egypt was a tikkun, was a rectification, was to correct the sin of the Tower of Babel, which originated in the original sin. And therefore, the finale of going out of Egypt, bringing the carbon Pesach, smearing the blood on the doorpost, was all a part of that process to fix that sin of the Tower of Babel and the original sin. The, the idea of Tshuva. But then also, we know the carbon Pesach has a whole other idea. The carbon Pesach represents the concept of transcendence, of jumping. God revealing himself on the first night of Pesach to redeem all the Jewish people. Like we said before, that primarily Pesach is not the concept of Tshuva. Pesach is the concept of a tzaddik. It's a newborn person. It's a person that has no past, that does nothing wrong. It doesn't, it's not working through a challenge. It's God just metamorphosizing. He's just transforming us into a new person. So therefore, Karim Pesach also has the aspect, which was the core redemption of Egypt, the idea of complete transformation, the idea of complete being a tzaddik to begin with as if, as if there is no past. It's a newborn baby. There's nothing to atone for. It's the Avodah of tzaddik. So again, the Korban Pesach has both ideas. Which is why the Korban Pesach had, is, could be either goats or sheep. Because they're both there in the Korban Pesach. Both the concept of tshuva, fixing a negative, like the sin offering. Both the idea of a tzaddik, just a new thing, a new entity, Clean slate completely, no past, the idea of a tzaddik, and just deepening our relationship with God, which is the concept of a tzaddik. Both things are there in Korban Pesach, and therefore Korban Pesach can be either a goat or a sheep. Now let's just connect it with us and talk about what that means to us. Let's connect to what we said before. So really, if you were to break up the tzaddik and the tshuva, Really, the idea of a tzaddik belongs to Nisan. The idea of tshuva belongs to Tishrei. For everything we said before. Because Nisan is just pure. Nisan is miracles, it's transcendence, it's purity. There is no problem with Nisan. It's, it's infinity which transcends the limitations and the challenges of the world of the finite. So therefore, that's like the tzaddik. There's, it has done nothing wrong. Just more and more light all the time. Tshuva is really Tishrei. Tishrei, that's why we do tshuva in Tishrei. That's why we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Right? Because... Because the whole concept of tshuva is there was darkness. There was an issue. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a challenge. There's a struggle. There's a weakness. There's a shortcoming. We're working it through. That's tshuva. That's this world. We're in the world. We're struggling. We're, we're, we're stumbling in, in the limitations of this world. And we're working it through. That's the concept of tishrei. That's tishrei. The world. We're doing the tshuva. We work, we're trying to work with the world. Yet, interestingly enough, we now say that in Nisan, both things are there. Yeah, it's true. In, in, in Egypt, they brought lambs because that was the main concept of Nisan, was the tzaddik, was the revelation from above. 
But taking it what we said before, this is the concept. We bring tshuva into Nisan because Nisan is just the intention, it's the machshava, it's the kavana, it's the goal of Tishrei. The purpose of Nisan is to then connect the Nisan to Tishrei. The purpose of the light, the righteousness, the holiness, the purity, the, the, the transcendence of Nisan is to bring it into the world of struggle, the world of Tishrei. Nisan is the goal of Tishrei, which is why we, we bring in the Tishrei to the Nisan process as well, and saying that in the Korban Pesach, it's not just the Korban Pesach is the tzaddik, the holiness, the newborn person, the newborn child. No. Nisan, we're saying, what are you going to do with this Nisan power? What are you going to do with this Nisan energy? You've got to take it, and when you go into the world of Tishrei, that will help you transform and work through the shortcomings of, 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 of your transgressions and your weaknesses. Because to try that into what that means to us, it's very simple. We, we have both aspects in our life. We have times which are like Nissan, times which seems to be very, going very, very smoothly. Things are going well, we feel spiritually uplifted, we're focused. We go to shul, we hear an inspiring story, we, we, we are in a good mood that day. We have the, the, the world of the tzaddik, so to speak. And when we are in that world, we also have to bring a carbon test up, we have to deepen that world. We have to do more, not just be complacent. If we're in a good space and we're spiritually uplifted, more spirituality. Let's try and add to it. Let's try and deepen it. And then sometimes we fall into a world of Tishrei. We fall into a world where we're challenged. We're not in a good mood. We're going through anxiety. We're going through a problem. Like now, we're going through a time which is a little bit tough. And in this time, we can have both times as well. But there are times which are more complicated. Times where we lock ourselves in or we get entangled in the finiteness and the limitations of this world. Then we also need a Korban Pesach. We can do it, we can go through. But we bring both things together. Because it's the power of the good times that stand us in good stead in the challenging times. And even as we go through this crisis at the moment, we need to steal away, we have to have a few minutes each day where we can just focus, learn something that's uplifting, learn something that's more spiritual, completely divorce ourselves from what is going on and just become energized. And then when we go back to reality, we can take that energy and, and transform it as well because those two worlds need to come together and therefore as we go through this whole process that's how we do it the Korban Pesach goats and sheep we have the sheep of our lives where everything is going well we take the healthy part of our lives the spiritual part of our lives and we use that energy the Nisan becomes the mission of Tishrei we use that energy then we are bogged down by challenges we are bogged down with things that are holding us back we can lift ourselves up, we can transform it, we can bring the light into the darkness. So that's just a thought and an insight about the Korban Pesach and about the upcoming Pesach. Let's hope that we're going to be able to, we will be able to, not, 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 not just let's hope, but we can do this. We can bring light into this darkness and hopefully very soon the darkness will disappear. Complete transformation will happen and then Nisan will be the month of miracles. Uh, Emirates Hashem very soon back with the Beit HaMikdash. In Israel, Bimheira Bihameina.